But because I always had this, like, I want to do something else type attitude as well, this so-called side hustle, which I don't like calling it because it's almost like a, something you can just throw away or you're just making yourself busy for no reason. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, people have called a lot of what I do a side hustle. Yeah. And uh, hearing somebody else refer to what you do as a side hustle can be a bit deflating, but uh, it also turns out to be more of a motivator to prove them wrong. Of course, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, you take all the bricks people throw at you, you build yourself a nice house and you stand on top of it. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. Our first interview with an expert on affiliate marketing has arrived, and that expert is Paul Motley. He has a rule I hope you too would follow. He won't advocate or participate in a business venture that he can't use himself. If it keeps him from sleeping at night, it's no good. Affiliate marketing, however, clears that hurdle with ease. It's a way of encouraging you to be yourself, to write, make videos, whatever content you can come up with on something you're passionate about, to build a following, and to generate revenue while aiding others doing the same. No matter what you're up to in life, I bet there's something you can talk about. On the one hand, it'll help you, and on the other, it'll help affiliate marketing. Have a listen, and you'll find out how. Paul Motley, good to have you here. Thank you for being on the show. Hey, you're welcome, man. This uh, this is awesome. I'm super excited. Same here. Same here. Uh, I'm 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 excited each time that each person that I talk to opens up whole new avenues to the industry, and it just gets bigger and bigger the more I learn. Our first question, the question of all questions is, tell us who you are and what you do. Oh man, that that is a leading question because I could be here for like three hours telling what I do. (laughs) But (laughs) essentially, I would class myself as an affiliate marketer. So I do various different marketing things and I sell other people's products. And when they make sales through the links that I've given them, then the company pays me a commission. That's probably the easiest way of explain it in the shortest, concisest way of doing it. Well, we are, we're certainly going to want to get into a little bit more detail on that. So let's start with uh, an overview of affiliate marketing. My understanding of it so far, and also based on how you've uh, described it, is that if a, a business wants to use an influencer's platform to sell products to customers, so I could write a blog, it could be on, on any of my interests, and then the affiliate marketer would reach out to me and want me to promote their product either by way of advertising or even sponsoring. Uh, Can you uh, take it from there for us? Yeah. So basically, I mean, if I was, let's say from a beginner standpoint, right? So let's say I decide I'm going to write a blog and like you were saying there, I'm going to write a blog, I'm going to update it and I'm going to have all this good stuff. Eventually it's going to start getting traffic to it and then people are going to start going to it. And what I could then do to monetize it would be to have products based around the content in the form of like little banner ads or maybe even clickable links. Now that would run to a third party site. And if a sale was made from that, then obviously it makes sense and I would get paid a commission. Let's say, for example, I wanted to talk about email marketing and how to set up, if you're selling something, then, you know, abandoned cart sequences or webinar registration reminders and all this good stuff, right? Or even just follow ups after you've created an email list of via a lead magnet and all that sort of thing then i could say right well i'm i actively use a, a company called active campaign for my email stuff so i'm like well plugged in total fanboy so why not yeah. recommend people what i use because i'm getting good results with it so other people could do too so then i will go to active campaign i will register as an affiliate for them and that will give me a unique link So I put that link into my blog so people click on it and they go ahead and decide to be a subscriber for Active Campaign, then Active Campaign is going to pay me a commission each month. Now, obviously, the benefits there is that I've not had to create my own product. I don't have to deal with support. I don't have to deal with refunds. I don't have to deal with any of the training and and the follow-up along with that. I just get paid a commission. And... There's various different types of affiliate product, if you like. Sometimes it's like a one-off fee, which I'll just get paid a commission based on a percentage. 
or it could be a subscription-based product, in which case I'll get paid each and every month that customer stays with the program. So that is kind of like where I like to go. I like to mix up between the what I call the passive income stuff, where I've already made the sale once and they keep using the software or the tool or the program or whatever it is each month. Yeah, that does sound appealing. Yeah, that makes yeah that makes it kind of appealing, and and we'll go into detail in a little while. But I mean, I've got I still get paid commissions on the sales that I made like three years ago. So you know, each and every month I get paid because those customers are still using what I recommended out to them. They tend to be smaller amounts, but it can also build up because if you're continually feeding the machine, then, you know, if you start off with one sale a month, then the following month you do another sale, and all of a sudden you've got two customers. After the third month, you've got three customers, four customers after four months, you know, and it starts building up that way. But it's also nice to build in the one-off programs as well, where you might get paid a little higher commission if it's a thousand dollar product quite often they give you like 50 percent commission so you can get like one off of 500 bucks and even beyond that you know 700 bucks commission thousands i've even seen so much of like two and a half thousand dollar commissions it does take obviously a little more work than just putting a blog post up and adding a link to generate those sales but you know it still can be quite rewarding down the line you know what, what's uh, interesting to me is that it seems to me that the the onus is on the product to continue to be relevant. So you were to pr- promote this product three years ago, and now the product has a responsibility to continue generating customer interest, whether that's acquiring new uh, customers in order to continue to feed the machine, right? Like, let's just say it was Uber that you did affiliate marketing for. Well, Uber's business model is they need more drivers to come in to continue lowering rates to continue to by lowering their rates, more customers come in and more customers come in, then uh, more drivers can make more money per hour. So that's great. But so within three years, you really didn't have to touch any of it. It just did its own thing and you just moved on with your day. Well, obviously I was looking to build my income. So I do actively work on that. But what I'm saying is that some sure. people which signed up over three years ago are still paying customers now. So I could have quite easily sat back and earned my 40 bucks a month off that single customer and you know multiply it out. It's probably around $1,200 in commission over the three years, which doesn't sound a lot over three years, but if I had like five, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 of those customers, then that starts making some serious serious difference to your life. Yeah, definitely. So the way we approach this on Debutify is we want to appeal to people who are entry level, who are trying to get in into all of this. So foundationally speaking, what are some of the first things that people can do to starts maybe not right away they can get into affiliate marketing because they have to build a base but how do they build that base well there's a number of ways and i always suggest because to get traffic to a website there's normally only two ways of doing it either organically or paid traffic that's kind of like it and and both of those have multiple stems going from it so if we said paid then you could say well, you could use um, PPC through Google or Bing. You could use YouTube ads. You could use Facebook ads. You could use Twitter ads, uh, Pinterest ads, uh, TikTok ads. You know, you could run mm-hmm. through and find paid platforms to get traffic. You know, there's probably 15 or 20 that I could think of if I had to write down on a piece of paper right now. But also on the flip side, it's exactly the same with organic as well. So you could do exactly the same organically. I would all, always say to people that go to the organic ways bef- until you're earning at least $1,000 a month because I think it becomes more emotionally important to people and also destructive if they're not getting the results with their own money through using paid ads. So the uh, last thing I want people to do is go out and sling a couple of thousand dollars on paid ads without really knowing what they're doing before they're getting any income. Because that's the sort of right. the way that they can start, like I say, getting themselves into trouble, start chasing the sales, and get themselves into you know a world of hurt. So I always say, like around about thousand dollars a month is a good position to be in, where you can then start uh, getting into ads. And of course, like anything, don't just blindly go into it on your own. You know, there's there's always a better way, and there are people which are way more successful than I am, way more successful than anyone starting out from zero because they've tread on the path already, you know, they've gone through the motions 
they know which works and what doesn't work. And sometimes it can be as simple as a couple of settings, or maybe it's a an image rather than a video. You know, little things like that can make all the difference to the effective return on investment that you're going to get by using paid advertising. So if you go into all the organic stuff, then Again, we've got a whole world of stuff, you know, and, and again, that's that's like building your Twitter following, building LinkedIn, Pinterest. Oh, God, we'll go through the whole, <laughs> all the ads, like we said, but without using the, the advertising platform. I mean, even down to Google SEO and, you know, Facebook and Facebook groups and Facebook pages and all that good stuff. You know, there's so many different ways to get started. I think probably the easiest way to start getting traffic immediately would be through your own Facebook profile. That's it's it's incredibly strange when you think about it. It makes sense because if someone sends you a friend request, for example, one of the first things you're going to do if you don't recognize that person is go to their profile. Mm-hmm. We'll do it, right? So we're going to go. Well, if I mean, if I if I have an attractive girl who's uh, asking to be my friend, I just ignore it right away because <laughs> this is like the twelfth attractive girl this week, and I said, "Guys, girls, taken. No, you know, there's uh, there's nothing here for you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, and a few of my buddies often uh, quip about that as well when they get like a friend request from um, an incredibly attractive woman by the name of George or something like that, and you just think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't even bother putting a fake name up. They got the fake picture, but they didn't put the fake name up. So it's you've got to be slightly careful. It's like, I don't know, guys, what do you think? Should I accept them or not? And I was like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know. Maybe you should ask your ask your mate, ask your partner about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not something you want to get involved with. But when you make a transformation between what you want to do online, are you just going to use your internet for social and personal purchases and and research and consumption or are you actually going to use the internet as a tool to not only start but build a business and that was one of the things that I decided a few years ago when I still had like you know tons of people on my friends list on Facebook for example all of which were like either personal contacts or people I went to school with people I work with friends family all that good stuff which is what Facebook was originally designed for, but I believe Mm -hmm. it's taken a completely different aspect now. And it's not just us as marketers doing it. Facebook actively encouraged us to do it by bringing in a paid platform because no one's going to boost a post or advertise a post on what they had for dinner last week. No, they're actually encouraging Mm -hmm. businesses to use Facebook. And that's why when people say, oh, I don't really know if I want to use my personal profile for business. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, but that is the platform now. That is a decision you're going to need to make. You either stick with that and you can't have two profiles. You know, I heavily discourage people from trying to create a separate profile for themselves. But there are ways to get around that. You can segment people, even on Facebook, into different so-called groups of contacts. So if you want to put a post up to all your friends and family, then filter them into a friends and family list, if you like, within Facebook mm-hmm. itself. And if you want to post about your kid's school day or, or you know, your excellent round at golf or whatever, you just post it to them. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's marketing content or something that you've got going on, then you can filter out those people and send it to people that might be interested in what you're doing. You know, I thought I was going to be an early adopter on Facebook. And then I get onto Facebook and all my friends had already gotten there. And this was when I was in high school and I've, I'm, I've long since uh, graduated, although I still have nightmares about it, but those are never going to go away. So what the first thing I observed about Facebook when I first went onto it is that it looked like it was more about preserving memories. It, it, the, instead of a, a, a chat messenger, which we know today, it was more like a, an inbox just for sending messages like, Hey, you know, it's so great to, uh, to, to, to see you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, let's catch up sometime. Whereas now Facebook is the tool people use to catch up. So it, it's not like say how, when Twitter transformed, it was a more of a, really a minute change because it went from 140 characters to 280 characters. Whereas Facebook transformed into something that was about reminiscing into now being involved in whatever is going on in the day. So I, could, I do understand some reluctance in that I think the 
the MO of Facebook uh, has has shifted from where it was to where it is now. Oh, yeah, totally. And you've got to look at the social platforms that were around before Facebook as well. I think if I'm remembering right, there was a site called Friends Reunited that was around. And, and you know, you would enter in your school, enter the school year you went in, and then a whole bunch of people would show up if they registered. And then you could connect with people that you haven't seen for a long time or whatever. But mm-hmm. you know, that was kind of like how it all really started. Anyone that's seen uh, the, the movie about Facebook and the conception and the advancement of it, you know, they'll know what it was originally designed for. But obviously, you know, they turned it into a business, which is now one of the, I think it's like the, is it like the third top visited site on the planet you know i think you've got google youtube and then facebook i think that's that's i could be wrong in those stats but it's pretty up there so yeah yeah, i mean again there are way more people using facebook just for that purpose than there is using it for their business or any type of marketing there was also a myspace and while you're talking i did just open up my browser to see if myspace is still around and it is there's also zanga which is like the predecessor to, I guess, Tumblr blogs, where people would just sign up for little blogs and they would share their blogs with their friends. And, you know, what I what I can say, having been involved in a lot of these uh, different social platforms, is that the, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a private guy, so I don't really uh, share uh, too much. And anything that I do share, I am always thinking is like, okay, is this something that boosts my platform in some way? And you were mentioning earlier about, you know, talking about uh, dinner last week. Well, lots of people do like to post their food because they want to be known as an authority on food. Yeah. So I, so it's, it's, it's amazing. It's conditioning people to uh, recognize that you can build, everybody wants to build a platform in some way, but nobody, no two platforms are the same. Some people want to have a platform of their, they're just, they just really like eating food. Some people want to have a platform where they're constantly sharing their opinion. Uh, I know some people who just write movie reviews as their little Facebook posts in the same way where I might post about, oh, uh, it's, it's raining. Not that I've ever done that, but everybody has this format and everybody has a different approach to it. Oh, oh probably in the UK every day there's someone posting something about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Dispel a myth for me. Does it rain more often than uh, it shine? It uh, depends on what part of the country you're in. So there you go. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll take it. There's some places which are more rainy than others, but uh, no, I mean, it's beautiful at the moment, 21 degrees, and, you know, and that's. Oh, gosh, I don't know what the Fahrenheit is. You guys in the States just used the Fahrenheit. So I would say it's like low 70s, I guess. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Canada. But uh, I th- yeah, we, we still use Fahrenheit too. My running joke is that Canada is just the United States wearing a helmet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, we're, we're, we're gluten-free America, that's all. Anybody, anybody tells you otherwise is kidding themselves, believe me. You think we think we can follow Canadian politics more than U.S. politics? Give me a break. Yeah. Anyways. I wanted to make sure that I have a full understanding about the uh, components to uh, affiliate marketing. And one of the components that stuck out was affiliate launches. So I want to hear more about that. And I also want to make sure anything parallel to that or any other components along those lines is also covered because that was the only one that I can find in my research. And I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything important. Yeah, well, affiliate launches, I mean, they are obviously the affiliate program has been around for a long time. eBay has an affiliate program. Amazon has an affiliate program. It's pretty much every website that you go to, if you scroll right down to the bottom, you can go and search out if they'll either call it a partner program or an affiliate program. So Mm -hmm. that's always been available. It's not like taboo and it's not like scam and all that malarkey. Whereas what happens with launches tends to be more, it's not like a, a big company which comes out and suddenly like eBay are here and we're going to launch it using uh, affiliates. That's not kind of like how it is. It might be someone launching their own program, for example, and they want to maximize the impact of the launch. So they're going to say, right, on September 28th, uh, this is coming out and no one can buy it until then. And we are going to run ads to it, but we're also going to get a whole bunch of other people which are experienced in affiliate marketing to try and help us sell it as well. So they are kind of like maximizing their own audiences because if you think if they've got an audience or a following on Facebook, for example, let's say it's like, I don't know, let's let's talk small. Let's say it's a thousand people. Now Mm -hmm. they can only reach a thousand people if they don't use paid ads. 
and if Facebook was really kind to them and let them, you know, reach every one of those thousand people, or if they had an email list of thousand people. Whereas if they then went out and got like ten affiliate marketers who also had a list of a thousand themselves, now their launch is not just going out to one thousand; it's going out to eleven thousand people. So that's how launches work by leveraging other people's audiences and lists. And quite often the program owners will not only say, okay, right, well, this is the commission rate you're going to get, and that's attractive, but quite often they'll run contests as well. So they might say, one I was recently involved with, they had a pre-launch contest. They were running a training series, and then there would be an offer after like the fifth day. And before the first day, there was a pre-launch and they said, okay, right, well, what we're going to do is everyone that gets people registered to the pre-launch, you get a link for yourself, you put it out to your audience, and the top five people are going to win prizes. So fifth place gets this, fourth place gets that, third place, second place, and then that is the first prize. And then they also had a contest list and prizes going out to the top 10. What was interesting is that I actually managed to rank third place for the pre-launch and then completely the wheels fell off when it actually came to the sales and I didn't make the top 10. So I was quite annoyed about that. Mm. But, <laughs> you know, I still did get some sales. I still did get a, a really nice prize for third prize, which was awesome. It was like a $400 product, which is always nice. And yeah, so that is how like the launches work. They're leveraging other people's audiences and they tend to put it up in a certain way. So they will expect to get so many sales when the when the cart opens and then they'll run through a series of follow-ups finally to a set date when they decide the cart is so-called closed. And normally it would be based on a special offer. You know, they're not going to not sell the product after that, but it might be an introductory price. It might include certain bonuses and, you know, better ways to get started with the product and all that sort of thing. And then it will go to what we call an evergreen, which is, means it's always available, but you don't get all the good stuff that you would have got if you bought during the launch. And again, that is something that people can be an affiliate for and get involved with. And the way that I look at it and the way that I always tell people, you can, you can go and find a lot of these launches on a website like Munchai, which will have a lot of people will list their launches on there, which includes uh, Warrior Plus, JVZoo, and a couple of other things that I do as well. But more often than not, depending on your level, you'll get program owners reaching out to you directly to say, look, I'm launching this soon. Would you want to be an affiliate for it? Quite often now I get review access as well, so I don't have to pay to actually buy the program myself. So I can actually go in there and have a proper look at it. But if you're just starting out, you're not going to get that, that option because they know that I can push the product for them. And if it aligns with what I do and it's something that I I would ethically feel okay with doing, then sure. I've got the time and the schedule to do it. Then obviously I will get involved. But if you're just starting out, the best way I would do is look at the product itself, look at the date when it's coming out, look at all the bits and bobs that they tend to give out to JVs, which is like the joint venture affiliates, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes they'll give you email copies. Sometimes they'll give you options for videos and, and maybe they'll you know schedule out themselves to be on people's podcasts or interviews and stuff like that. And just build content around the launch before it happens. Because quite often when people are going to buy something, they will go onto YouTube or they'll go onto Google and search for the product plus pricing or product plus review or product mm, yeah. testimonials. So if you can get the content out there to start with and then start building up the, the views and get it ranked and all that good stuff there, you're going to get more traffic coming in on the front end. I mean, there was one program which I started being an affiliate for earlier on in the year, and I got well in front of it, meaning that my content was out there. It was live. I mean, out of the top 10 videos for the terms that I wanted, I had five spots. That's just on YouTube. So when people were going and actively searching for this product, there was a video from me. In On the video, there was a link. There was created my own bonus stack as well so not only are you going to get all this from joining abc they're going to give you all this they're going to give you all that but i'm also then going to give you all this as well so that was created my own sort of like bonuses to help people make their decision which is going to become it always complementary to the product or service that we're actually talking about because it just makes sense that way 
if we were talking about a way to generate sales or, or on Facebook, then one of my bonuses would be how to generate organic traffic through Facebook. Do you know, it's, it's got to complement mm-hmm. what you're selling. Yeah, you know, there, it reminds me of one of the more costly purchases that I made recently is a, a portable monitor. And the more expensive the product is, the more one should be doing research on And Not to say that less expensive products are not too worthy of research. Uh, Lauren knows I could have saved some money here or there. But if I'm going to spend $400 on something, I want to know more about it. And so what I did was I typed in uh, desk lab monitor reviews. And it seems to me that what you're describing is what I was looking at. It's different uh, websites who were a part of an affiliate launch program, and they're all giving their their take on it. And one key takeaway from this is that this is an opportunity for them to uh, show what they're made of and to entice people to stick around and continue consuming their content. So, and and it, and it goes for like let's just say a new a, a movie has come out you know there just so happens to be another avengers film everybody on youtube is going to give their take on the avengers and the quality of their review and how well they they do the review and their tone and you know their sense of humor whatever it is they've got can get people to stick um have you uh, can can you speak to your experiences how effective um these different affiliate or these different partners have been able to actually retain guests and retain readers or viewers or listeners or whatever it is while also promoting a product elsewhere? Because you have to imagine they're just coming onto this website to have a brief look. There's no guarantee they'll stick around. No, absolutely not. And I think that you created a key point there because that person is then starting to build their own following, their own audience. So although it might not be the product for you this time, there might be another product that they review in a later date. So if, if you can resonate with that person, when you go and do your research and quite often people are researching, they're either right ready to buy or they're just about ready to buy. You know, these are sort of like buyer triggered um, keywords and searches that people are doing. You know, generally speaking, I don't go out there and look out for something like to fit a car that I don't have and stuff like this. But yeah, you will engage with them and then become part of their audience. So that maybe next month, there's something else that they are reviewing and it might be yes that's exactly what i need right now i'm going to go for it and that is essentially how affiliate marketers grow their income because they are doing it in a certain way where they're building their audience but also building an email list so they can keep in contact with people and build that relationship you know there is actually a third uh, uh group not as uh, important because the purchase is already made but one of the other things that reviews can do is help validate a person's decision once they've made it i especially growing up you know being uh, big into video games aside from playing the game itself one of the things i would enjoy is going on and reading reviews of games that i've already bought just to hear different opinions of it maybe they would point out something that i didn't notice before yeah reviews and testimonials social proof isn't it so yeah, that's it. And the crowd follows the crowd at the end of the day. If they see a ton of people buying something, then they're going to think it must be okay. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've only resisted uh, one thing in that regard, and that was Game of Thrones. I gave it two seasons. That was as far as I can go with it. Oh, it all happened in Series 3. <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all I, not to get too far off on the Game of Thrones, but apparently uh, Season 8 didn't go so well, so I actually feel good about my choice. Well, I think it was just the... Personally speaking, the, the last couple of episodes, I, I've i got a feeling that the writers were due a vacation and they were counting down. They might have been counting down the days for it. And and I imagine that the vacation was probably, you know, they were, they were never coming back off it. So it was kind of like, yeah, true. Oh, it doesn't matter what we put, let's go. We're okay. It's kind of like a lot of people say like, oh, you, you got like your kitchen done by the guys on a Friday afternoon, stuff like that. So... Yeah, I mean, as 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 a series, it is pretty decent. And I have to admit, I did the same as you. I went through series one and two and gave up. And then it came out over here as like box sets. So you could watch the whole thing, you could binge watch. You didn't have to sit and wait each week for the next episode. Mm-hmm. And I think I was, I think I had the, the flu or something like that. So I was laid up for like five days, not COVID, right? So <laughs> this was like okay. a few years ago. And I think I must have just, sat there and binge watched everything with a box of tissues and uh, for my nose that is and you know just watched the whole oh, right. yeah, yeah yeah make sure that's very very clear and everyone knows why and yeah just 
binge watched the whole lot and it was worth it. It was worth it. I'm never getting that time back, obviously, but you know, it's, it was worth it. Right. Okay. So I, I think we can actually uh, uh, tie this into to work we're talking about because let's say that you're, you're, you, you quite enjoyed it and you even had opinions on an episode to episode basis. You can turn this into something that can actually boost your platform because you can write about it. You can start a blog, you can start a video review series, you can get a conversation going and offer your contribution to, uh, to the greater conversation. And also one other thing, just briefly, I mean, you know, the world building is pretty important and that was quite the world to have built. So uh, I can't see why they couldn't revisit that world uh, down the line. It seemed to me that they said, no, we don't want to do this anymore. We're done. We don't want to come back and, uh, and, and visit this. We didn't even have a book to go off of with this one. So that part I can, un- I can understand. Yeah. But if you think about it, what they actually did, I mean, over here in the UK, they, on the, the channel that it was on, they had the episode and immediately after they had like a, a talk show about the episode and they had guests on it. So it started building other people's brands based off that product because the guests that came on, if you found them funny or amusing or like them, you might go out and see what they've got going on and, and their content and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it goes around all the way around, you know, uh, it happens in like on TV, it happens in business. It happens on a small scale, large scale and everywhere in life, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I had the same thing cause uh, I'm a fan of the walking dead and I've uh, stuck through the, the series and now I'm waiting for them to come out on Netflix because we've got the subscription. But they would do the same thing. They would do Talking Dead right afterwards. And, and and as you say, they would bring guests on and they would weigh in on it. And how they handled it and how they talked about it might um, lead people to want to check them out afterwards. And then, of course, you get into late night television. And, the, and late night television is one of the most uh, grandiose and effective forms of advertisement that there is because it's, well, that's basically it. You get you get your first 10 minutes of, uh, of laughter and then, well, and then you're, you're promoting your guests and bands get to come on and play music and uh, everybody walks away happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, so there's a couple of other uh, operations you're involved in. There's a high ticket lead Uh This yeah. is one of yours, right? Just want to make sure. Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, you indicate that this method is the most, uh, I mean, you know, it could be other Paul Motley. So there's another Joseph Ayani also involved in the arts. You in- indicate that this method, is like the most beginner friendly way to grow your business online. So why is high ticket lead machine so user friendly? First off, I gave it a really terrible name because it's not high ticket at all. It's, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's not yeah, the product itself is, uh, it's like a blueprint to how to set up your Facebook profile to take advantage of those, that traffic that you're going to get through certain activities that you can do online. You know, we briefly touched about it, but if I sent you a Facebook friends request and you don't know who I am, you go and check out my profile. So that is kind of like the loosest way. And there's a way to actually monetize that. And you can then get people clicking away onto your product or service or your website or your lead magnet or anything like that. And it's, and it's setting it up in a correct way. So it's fully optimized. So it doesn't just look like yet another Facebook profile. It looks more like a landing page. And it looks more attractive and encouraging for people to use. So that's kind of like how it all works out. And there's like a blueprint that you can get directly. And that costs like $7. So that will just give it all in a new book, showing you exactly where to put what and how to put it all together. And that's kind of like the start and the front end of it. So yeah, the name High Ticket Lead Machine, probably not the best I could have come up with at the time, but... It was something that I thought, you know what, it's not just for, it could be used for anything. And I thought high ticket might sound more attractive to people. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. A couple of other things that you're up to as well is your, you also have a, a boot camp uh, function. And the first thing I'm, I'm wondering every time I hear boot camp is if you, know, you actually do like shout out people. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I mean, that's, that, that's almost the, the I think, because. Uh, that's oh gosh now i'm trying to imagine and think which one it is because over the years i've developed so many different trainings and so many different uh, programs that that people can get access to for a while there was a program that i ran which was almost like group mentoring so it, it allowed people to s- sort of access me and they paid a monthly fee for it and that was that was part of the journey i guess to where i am today it was something that i wanted to take a look at and investigate because then rather than promoting a program where I got an affiliate commission for each month, 
it was my program and I got paid the actual fee each month. So it was like, instead of like 20% commission, I'm getting 100% because it's my thing. And I'm putting my spin on everything, giving people the benefit of my experience, showing them what I do, how I do it, the the wins, the, the mistakes, so that they can learn before mm-hmm. they actually start doing it themselves. And that was kind of like where I wanted to go with it. But ultimately, I wanted to put something together which I knew was going to make a big impact. And over the years, it's been within me and I know how to do certain things. And I thought if I can get this into other people's hands, they can replicate exactly what I've done because I'm going to say, I did this. I tried that. It didn't work. I tried this. It did work. Do this instead of that. You know, and it's kind of like almost almost a, a done with you type of program where it's not done for you. It's not mm-hmm. do it yourself. It's almost like this is how we do it. Feedback to me if things are going as well as you want or feedback the wins that you're getting to share with others. And that is ultimately where it came out. But the idea for it was that I use a software called uh, ClickFunnels for a lot of my business. And again, that is something that pays out a commission basis each month because it is a software as a service. So as an affiliate, that's great. I get paid each month for each user, which is what we alluded to before, the fact that I've got a couple of people that even joined three years ago and they're still paying for their service because they're getting a return on investment by using it, which makes sense. But what I was shocked to learn was that even though there's like 100,000 or nearly over, I think it's about 85,000 affiliates in their affiliate group, if you like, there were only 70 people which actually earned over 100,000 with it, with their affiliate program. And that was, a, you know, I was talking to a guy called Ben, the affiliate manager over there, and I says, you know, what's going on? He says, would you believe it? A lot of people actually join as an affiliate, don't do anything. And I thought, right, well, that's not right. And I'm saying, right, one one of the big wins, if you like, is having over 100 customers, which will, they call it the, we can win the dream car award. Mm -hmm. It means you get a nice little steering wheel, you get an extra $500 a month to lease a car. So that's on top of your monthly recurring income. And I worked it out roughly to be worth about $60,000 a year to have that achievement which is something that I actually managed July 2019. So I thought, well, there's there's not that many people which have done that either. So that's what I'm going to focus on. That's what I want to present to people and show them not what was working, but how I did it and what is working now. And that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I noticed that you were saying, yeah, like not was working or uh, do it yourself or done for you. I think the term that, I might go with is done in tandem because this is something that you're doing as well. You're still actively involved in the industry. So it's not as if you're a historian imparting your knowledge on to people as you've moved on. It's more like a college instructor or college professor. Uh, Typically, you know, the instructors that I had in college, at least, they were all people who were still active in the industry. And so they themselves were continuing to learn and continuing to develop the process, especially in, uh, I mean, in e-commerce, there's very little that's static. Some stuff is static. Uh, I talked to Casey Chow and he said, you know, emailing has really found a great foundation and everything seems to transform around it. So some things do stay, but lots of it uh, continues to change too. Yeah, totally right. Totally right. And and even the things that we were doing to promote ClickFunnels, for example, even like a year ago, they uh, don't work now or we can't do it anymore for one reason or another. So you have to evolve. You have to have different ways of doing it. And that was one of the key things that I wanted to make sure that I covered and so that people could do it, you know, rather than, mm-hmm. oh, well, let's take um, pay-per-click, for example. There was a time people were using paper, you know, Google Ads, basically, to get sales through ClickFunnels. But what happened was there was only a very few people which knew exactly how to do it and they weren't telling anybody because they were doing so well from it. And right. you, know, you would get a, a general idea. You would get a overview. Even on paid programs, you'd still get like almost a nuts and bolts, but you wouldn't actually get, this is the campaign. These are the keywords. These are the bits. You know, you wouldn't get all that stuff. 
and it was only through getting coaching myself. I, I went to a few people which I knew were doing well with it and got coaching and consulting with them that I got access, you know, I got the keys to the kingdom. I got access to it. But what then happened was that people started trying to do it themselves and they weren't quite getting it right. And it resulted in some crazy numbers going on. I remember one guy got stung for like 6,000 in one day because he didn't have it set up right. Oh, no. Yeah. So And, and he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't hardly get any sign-ups either, mainly because somebody else had took a strategy, not applied it correctly, which meant those people which were doing the strategy correctly ended up paying the price. So it was it was a nuts day. And then ClickFunnels turned around and says, look, we don't want this happening anymore. Don't use pay-per-click ads. So that whole option went away. So then a lot of people then started scratching their heads, oh, how can we do it now? But there are still ways to do it. It's just knowing what's going to work and what's not. Right. So because these people were holding on to some key information, it strikes me as this was a time when there were a lot more questions than there were answers. And people didn't think that, people were thinking that if they don't share, if they they share the information, it's going to hurt their bottom line. When in reality, what's turned out to be the case, especially with what we're talking about today, is that everyone is contributing to an ecosystem because it's all trying to find ways to solve problems for customers and earn money in exchange. So this collaborative effort, I can't see it being a, a better method than everybody actually working together and, and cross-pollinating and finding ways to promote one another as our product and services. But I can understand at a certain point if there was some paranoia where anybody who managed to latch onto it thinking, well, the internet's going to die in like five years, so I might as well make the, make the most out of it that I can. Yeah, yeah, I get you on that. So you also mentioned you won the dream car uh, contest and it turned into a dreamcarmentor.com program. So you've, you've probably given some of us uh, the details on this, but let's just make sure that we've covered it in full. So tell us about the dream car mentor program. Uh, first off, depending on when people listen to this, it's actually sort of like almost semi closed because I opened it to uh, beta access. I would suggest very cheaply considering the re- possible returns. So sure. people go to that site now, they, they either will or won't be able to get access to it. So, so. Oh, um, for what it's worth, we have these banked pretty far in advance. So uh, years would be maybe like a month and a half to two months on release. In that case, it would be totally fine. Please go to the site. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like everything. I like proof of concept. It's all very well, me being able to do it, but I want to be able to show and and help other students do it as well, which is why I had a beta launch to start with. And I only let like four or five people in because it wasn't a point of, I want to charge lots of money and and get loads of people in. I wanted to get more more of a core of people which were prepared to take action rather than having to deal with um, support tickets for people which either didn't understand or were just really there to see what was going on and then refund. You know, it it just didn't work like that. And there may well be when it's in a full launch, there won't be a refund policy for the simple fact is that you're either deciding to do it and you're prepared to do it or don't do it. It's like, you know, Yoda said, you know, well, what was that famous phrase he said, like, you know, do or not do there is not no try or something like that whatever oh yeah 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 um i forget where it's from it's either from star wars or tobogganing uh do or do not there is no try that's it yeah yeah that's it do or do not there is no try that's it yeah so effectively that that's the type of person that i want and i mean it would gratify me nothing more than sitting on stage because click has this big event they do each year when you know uh, things are normal and people get the rewards for the Dream Car Award. And I would have, you know, it would gratify me nothing more than being on stage with a whole crowd of people getting their Dream Car Awards because of what I told them and shared with them. That'd be awesome. So just one small question about the Dream Car Awards. Is there, do they only hand out somebody a year or is it anybody who crosses the threshold? Anyone that crosses the line, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's going to be quite a few people on stage. <laughs> it could be, yeah. Like I say, they've still got to go out there and make the sales. So, and that seems to be the, the the biggest stumbling block is people constantly shouting out and wanting to know how to do it. 
those some people will put in the work but they've still got to know how to do it it's all very well you can be busy all day and not get anywhere i think if you're me i don't know i I, I dream more about like a dream home than a dream car, but that's just because I'm like a, a habitual commuter, but that's, it's all good either way. Uh, I want, I had a couple of curiosities and by the way, we're, we're, the, the, you're, you're giving us uh, so much great information and there's some, even at, even we, I'm not even like halfway through the questions that I have prepared. I'm writing down new ones too. So I just want to uh, thank you for all, all of this, uh, this great insight. But there's some stuff to to, uh, to your background that I'd like to ask about, just because I want to remind people that nobody, no one I've talked to got into e-commerce right away. Everybody has an origin story of what led them into this. So one interesting way that I saw your development is I had a look at your LinkedIn profile. You were in sales for about nine years. Uh, a director for a different company, uh, another 15 years. And then there was a four year crossover from your digital marketing enterprise and your uh, directorship position. So for what I researched on you, the inspiration to pursue your online entrepreneurship happened because you wanted to get your store online. So I want to know about that four year period when you were starting to implement your, uh, the, implement the internet into your, um, brick and mortar business and how you went from you know the stone ages to the to the enlightened age well i think um first off uh, linkedin is probably massively inaccurate and i need to update that um but oh well, that's everybody's linkedin profile i have so many jobs uh, yeah, that i didn't I mean, put on there so yeah people i mean i always felt like i had something within me which was better than what i was doing so, you know, even though I was running my own brick and mortar business, I always felt like there was something more to go for. I always thought mm -hmm. I can absorb things, I can learn things, I can implement things, and then I can teach things. And that was kind of like where it all started out. Back in the day, I mean, even when I was probably 20, 21, or even 19 at the time, you know, trying out network marketing and stuff like that, way before, like, internet was around, really, um, you know, Certainly lots of sites weren't around at that, at that time and trying to get things done. But also by running my own business as well, you kind of had to figure out ways to not only just generate leads, but also continually do so as well. And it was that mm -hmm. transformation that led to, to obviously having to create my own website for it and over the years integrating booking services on there, getting ads out on Facebook and and trying to generate leads and that was kind of like how it went but because i always had this like i wanted to do something else type attitude as well this so-called side hustle which i don't like calling it because it's almost like a something you can just throw away or you're just making yourself busy for no reason mm -hmm. well you know people have called a lot of what i do a side hustle yeah and uh, hearing somebody else refer to what you do as a side hustle can be a bit deflating but uh it also turns out to be more of a motivator to prove them wrong of course yeah yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. You know, you take all the bricks people throw at you, you build yourself a nice house and you stand on top of it, right? So that's, <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it. Do it. But yeah, it was always that way. And and, it, and that was really where it really started happening was, like I said, when I discovered after using several platforms to try and generate leads, I, I found ClickFunnels and started using that. But then because I started becoming more active in the ClickFunnels groups, I started noticing people posting affiliate commissions and stuff like that. And that piqued my interest. I thought, hey, I'm paying whatever it was a month at the time. And I know a few people which this would really help and, you know, have conversations with them and eventually put them on as customers. But then as more people started asking questions in those groups, I was in a position to answer those questions because I had – gone through that stage myself i'd been the one asking how do you do this how do you do that what about the connection there right. you know what's the best way of doing this that the other and then i was able to help people i started um, getting requests through facebook whether it be on messenger or doing zoom calls i must have done hundreds of zoom calls to people over the years just because they wanted me to show because half the time i'd be typing away and I'd go do you know what let's just i'll show you get on the screen share Show them how to do mm -hmm. it, job done. And that quickly grew from almost nothing to $1,000 a month based on the people which I was helping. Because what surprised me was the proportion of those people asking the questions weren't using the platform already. And when they were ready, they came to me and said, look, I want to join. Have you got a link? And I still get this today. 
even on my own podcast platform, I get people go, oh, what do you use for your podcast? Have you got a link? You know, and and that like comes out that way as well. I mean, literally had a commission through this morning. We weren't expecting it. It's not exactly a life change, but it was seventeen dollars. Mm-hmm. And all I've done is uh, created a podcast, created content for it, and done nothing else. You know, I've never gone to anybody and you know hassled them. Never sent a single email, nothing. But that's that's all about building an audience and how it works with that. So, yeah, it just started taking off from there. And then it started implementing paid ads and going forward from that. You know, it's, it's, it can be baffling being the, the knowledgeable one because just from my own experience, uh, freelancing and podcasting, a lot of what I do and did, like, you know, publish podcasts for other people too, it seems so simple to me. It seems so, so easy. And yet there's, there's, you can never fully appreciate just how little somebody else might not know oh, yeah. and how, oh, oh, an R, an RSS feed. Like, oh, that's like the number one thing that I've had to describe to people. Oh, what's an RSS feed? I'm like, you know what? I actually forgot, but just give me a second. I'll go find that out for you. Yeah. Uh, the RSS feed confused me for a very long time, but then I, I think I Googled something. I found a bit of code and I copied and pasted it and then left it alone. That was it. That's all I need to know about RFS feeds. It worked, and I don't know how it worked, and I don't know why it worked, but it works, and that's fine for me. Yeah. It took me five years before I realized it stands for Rich Site Summary. Okay. Never knew that either. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the uh, background uh, curiosity that I find, and yeah, I don't know, maybe this is uh, LinkedIn being even more inaccurate than uh, – uh, hitherto unprecedented, but uh, you also have a background in chemistry. Is that right? Interestingly enough, that is correct. Yes, I will. Okay. So, was there anything from chemistry that, or any takeaways from chemistry that influences what you're doing or how you're doing it? Uh, yeah, drugs are bad, right? So okay, <laughs> just do that right away. I'll write that one down. <laughs> yeah, write that one down. I'm mean, hearing conflicting opinions, but you know, I, I take everybody's. So, yeah. Yeah, let's not get political. So that's one thing. Yeah, I would say it was. It, what it did really was it, it honed my skills, I guess, on the the way that I learned things and the methodical ways that I complete tasks. Mm-hmm. Because if, you, if you're doing anything scientific, anything with chemistry, it tends to be a, a procedure. You know, you start right. with this, you, you pour out a level of that, you mix it with a level of this, you apply this much heat to it for this long, and, and you know, you go through and then you start recording the results and everything like that. And that is one of the things that I've transferred later on in life is that I know that I work way better with lists and objectives. And if I have a large goal, I tend to split it down into smaller goals and then break that up into lists as well. So being able to be methodical on what you do is something that is going to stand you in good stead because if you are getting results, even if they are only micro wins all the way along, you still feel like your business is moving forward. Mm-hmm. Typical example today, I altered a couple of things that I was sending out via email, and that was one of my objects on the list. I know now it's going to be more effective because of what I, the change that I did today. And it's only a small change, but the results will show for a long time. Now, do you, is it, this is just my, my base understanding of chemistry. And by the way, when you said uh, drugs are bad, it didn't occur to me right away, but were you referencing Breaking Bad by any chance? <laughs> I watched that the other day actually yeah it was great <laughs> yeah um, so was it that the uh, the smaller uh, results were providing a foundation for the more fundamentals or the larger issues or did I get that right yeah yeah pretty much I mean the way I look at it right now and I have this conversation constantly with uh, my partner as well I could pretty much walk away from uh, having an audience being known doing video interviews like this or doing podcasts or writing on a blog or sending emails out, I could pretty much disappear. And I know that mm-hmm. although the affiliate income will go down, it wouldn't go away. And I would be quite happy living on that for the rest of my life. You know, uh, you know, a few gaps would need plugging in over, over the years, I guess, but effectively um, that's what I could do. And I'd, I'd probably be reasonably happy with that. But then I know that I would still be sitting there thinking, ah, there's something more, there's something more, I'm missing something. And that something I think is the ability to share it with others and help Mm -hmm. other people. 
and I think that it would be rather selfish of me to keep that knowledge to myself. And I think that is what I've been struggling or battling with all those years is rather than trying to do it all on my own, I should be doing something that I know that I can impact others with. The typical example there is the very first person that signed up with ClickFunnels for me was my personal trainer. He was desperate to go and get a few things online and, and he was getting fed up with doing one-on-ones with the gym and all this sort of thing. Long story short, he now runs a group coaching program and he's not in the gym anymore. And he's as happy as Larry. Right. Rest. And that for me is like, that's cool. Another guy, guy called RJ Ahmed, he actually came from an e-commerce background, lived in, um, I think it was Dubai at the time, moved back to Pakistan now. And I remember sitting on, on the call with him for about 45 minutes, explaining to him what ClickFunnels was, explaining to him how it could help him grow his business. And fast forward 18 months, now he's created his own program. He's, I think in one day, he earned more than it cost for his entire semester of college, right? And so, <laughs> and like, you know, it's a serious change going on. And that's the sort of impact that, wakes me up in the middle of the night and think yeah i could do this and i can help that person you know and that's what gets me up every morning as well knowing that off the back of my podcast has been three other people started podcasts and you know they're doing really well with it as well you know and and that's the thing that keeps me going and that satisfies that need whereas i knew that if i stepped away from all of it i'd be thinking ah, i'm really you know almost guilty that i'm not sharing the knowledge with people i'm not helping others that's incredible. I mean, I've, you know, even even from what I read about you, and you mentioned it earlier that you do have uh, ethical standards. You know, things do have to be. I want to get the exact word for it: amenable to your conscience. You know, you, you have to be able to get uh, get a good night's sleep, and I think that's a great way to remember f- for everybody to keep in mind is what are you going to do that's going to make it easier for you to sleep versus what could you do that would make it harder for you to sleep? Because we spend a third of our life sleeping, so the success of our waking life is tantamount or it's an indicator of how good our sleep is. Uh, well, to start with, there's probably a million and one things that you could do, which wouldn't be ethical. Yeah. So no doubt. <laughs> so let's not do that. Of course. Of course. As far as like the ethical stuff, I would rather recommend a product or service that I use myself personally and had success with then randomly pick something off of ClickBank, for example, that I have no experience with. If I don't believe it's actually going to help the person purchasing it, I wouldn't mm-hmm. recommend it. And that's a simple fact. There's other things that you can do or, or shouldn't do as far as like ethics and stuff like that. And I could, I could tell you some right good stories about that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> and some other- uh, I'll, I'll have to talk with the uh, with the others to see if we yeah. can make that a different episode. And observations of other people's antics. I mean, again, I'm not going to call any names out, but recently I saw somebody, and again, it's not gender specific, so I don't want to point it out at all, posting income claims on Facebook to attract people to buy a program from their partners and the pictures showed a different income it was like a a four or five day showing income for this day that day that day that day and the the two pictures didn't match 100 percent so it was kind of like (laughs) that's obviously been faked they're crowing about how much money they're earning and everyone's going, oh, yeah, that's brilliant. It's brilliant. And how do I do it? Ah, oh, send me a DM and all that bullshit. And it's kind of like, don't be scamming people on fake fake results. It's really not cool. I just don't like that sort of thing because it's effectively almost like using magnetic sponsoring principles from Mike Dillard, but for evil. You know, mm. that's really something people should stay away from. Well, I'll only uh, say uh, one thing to weigh in on it. As much as you know, we can certainly go on with it, and I would certainly want to hear more about it. You know, it's only there's only so much that we should uh, give it oxygen to. But what I find is that the difference between good and evil is that good is giving something thought. Uh, evil is a lack of thought or a thoughtlessness or carelessness. It's somebody who would post that and not 
may, if, they, if they would, even if they were to consider the implications, maybe they would have like internal struggle and they say, okay, well, you know, maybe this, maybe I have a reasoning for this, but normally it's just people who don't think, who don't care and they just do it. And it puts the onus on others to have to contribute additional good in order to make up for that, to rebuild trust with the, uh, with the industry or, yeah. build, or rebuild think, an understanding with the platform that, and the legitimacy of it. In that particular case, it hadn't paid attention to the details of the lie. And that's what it was <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because they wouldn't intentionally put that mistake on there. I had one other, I guess it's one other sort of ethical related question, I suppose. And then I'm going to uh, get you to uh, help us wrap this up. So one of the things that I've been wondering uh, since we first established uh, some of our conversational threads is that have you encountered any instances, it could be you personally, or it could be some of the people that you've talked to where there was conflict between the content that people were writing and the partnerships that they had formed uh, have there been situations where somebody might have had to address their writing? And I, and I don't mean it in an overt, you can't say this, this is vile, but more in a, you know, if you could just maybe adjust this uh, writing here or there. I know, I, anyways, I don't, I don't want to uh, decide yeah, for you how you would approach it, but I want to know how you would deal with it. Um, that's not something that really has come up. Uh, and, and if it has, then I haven't really given it much thought to. But yeah, dealing with other people's ideas and, and principles is always going to be a sticky subject because ultimately, sure. you know, we're, we're dealing with people all over the world with different backgrounds, different upbringings, different uh, ethics and ethoses in their business and life. Um, so you might think you know someone because you've read a few of their Facebook posts, but, you know, you could drop a comment and then all of a sudden you're getting a barrage of abuse on DM or being called out in different groups that you're not part of. So... I think there's still a degree of caution to be used no matter what. That's reasonable. I mean, it is all about public profiling after all. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I was, that, that one was a uh, uh, nagging in the back of my mind and I wanted to uh, ask about it because I do know like, depending on what company you're working with, a company might not necessarily want a person based off of how they characterize their opinions. And uh, I, I can go on to this whole, whole thing about how this magazine was like, they had a, they had a sponsor wrap the magazine in their advertisement package. I've never seen it before. And then they reviewed the product and they gave the product an abysmal review because it, well, it just wasn't good. So I, I always admired them for that. Uh, and I know correlation is not causation, but they went out of business about a year later. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this has been, uh, this is, really has been incredible. And uh, I can definitely see myself uh, listening to it again, just because there's uh, so much here that I want to uh, write down and look into. Um, for people who are inspired and they want to uh, get moving, what's the first thing you recommend they do? The easiest way, really, and, and I do send people to this, would be to just start out with my podcast, which is Ultimate Affiliate Marketing. I do mm-hmm. this on a daily basis. So unless the wheels have fallen off by the time you're listening to this and it's not there anymore, which I doubt it, we've got... Uh, over 125 episodes on there now so it's just continually running because that's where you're going to get to learn and I am naughty by doing this because I tend to give people all the information out that I've learned over the years and paid thousands for so you're getting content um, on, on my way of doing certain things that other people are charging you big bucks to find out and I don't go into that much detail anywhere else it's purely on the podcast itself mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, the podcast name is just Ultimate Affiliate Marketing. And of course, it's free and everyone loves free stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've listened to a couple of episodes so far and uh, it, it inspired some of the stuff that I wanted to talk to you about today. Okay. So I, 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 having listened to it, I can also recommend it too, wholeheartedly. And again, it's free. And so is our podcast here, Ecomonics. All right, Paul, uh, I have to say uh, thank you again in case I haven't said it at least seven times. I appreciate everything that we've talked about today and I look forward to next time. Awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. You might have found this show on many number of platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoyed this content and want to help us thrive, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at debutify.com. 
or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to Debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next.